So uh, this presentation is a, uh, an example of one implementation of a biodiversity institution and biodiversity informatics. And I stress it's only one impl in, uh, implementation. And I also stress that is, it is completely conditioned on historical uh, constraints and cultural constraints, which may or may not apply uh, to your individual institution. Some will, some won't, because everything starts with history and, and has a cultural context that can constrain the directions in which it goes. But there are, there are certain principles, I think, that, that apply to all of these institutions, no matter their history and constraints. So the Biodiversity Institute and University has a, uh, a very uh, uh, long and uh, distinguished history. It began as four separate systematic museums on the campus of the University of Kansas. The first in this building, called Dyke Hall, um, was called the Museum of Natural, or the Natural History Museum, and it was part of the original charter of the University of Kansas back in 1866, where the charter said, teach the people of Kansas about nature. And that, that was essential. Now, if that isn't a biodiversity statement by an enlightened uh, policy group, the legislature that founded the University of Kansas, I don't know what else is. <coughs> they were a lot smarter in 1866 than they are now, because uh, I don't think the legislators would say the same thing now. Oh God, this is going to be on YouTube. <laughs> not and, and, and you just made a big point of it. <laughs> uh, so what's this, this uh, natural history museum was only a museum of vertebrates, fossil, and living. And here I'm highlighting uh, pictures of the birds in honor of Professor Peterson. The second systematic museum was the herbarium, also since KU's founding. It has the largest collection of Great Plains plants in the world. Third, located in this building originally, but since, since moved, was the Snow Entomological Museum uh, in place since 1870. Uh, one of the world's uh, finest arthropod collections, about four million specimens, perhaps the best, or you know, among the best bee collections and, um, and beetle collections in the world. You want to study bees and beetles, you have to either borrow specimens from the University of Kansas or come to them. 800,000 specimens have now, been have now been digitized. When people get scared about, oh my God, the Entomology collections are huge, where do we start? You start with number one, and you go to number two, and you go to number three, and you establish priorities. We're gonna do beetles first, and from this country, and so on and so forth. So we've done 800,000. We're not at four million yet, but you know what? We'll get there. And I think every single institution that has huge collections, that should not be a stumbling block. Fourth, uh, a collection in this building, the Invertebrate Paleontology Museum since 1884. One of the largest invertebrate paleontology collections at any academic institution and indeed at any institution in the world. These four were combined in 1995. They were unified by my predecessor, who was director uh, of the Natural History Museum, into um, one museum now called the Biodiversity Institute. I assisted in a small way in their unification, but the credit has to go to my predecessor. So step one, unify. Unify, unify, unify. If you haven't started with separate things, don't, don't do that. You have more critical mass. You have, you, you want to unify across taxa, You want to unify across biodiversity approaches, whether you're doing phylogenetics or systematics or biogeography or paleobiology, you want to unify. 
If you want to unify across evolutionary biology and, uh, and ecology. Because one makes no sense without the other in biology. Having said that, the University of Kansas is perhaps the only university in the United States where the separate taxonomic or systematic enterprises are, uni are unified. So we are large, we are powerful, we have critical mass, and we have terrific results. But places like, and I'm not meant to be disparaging to these universities, Berkeley, Harvard, Texas, Yale, Michigan, That's enough. Very large, wonderful, prestigious universities are still atomized into separate herbaria, separate zoology museum, separate entomology museum, separate zoology museum. That is not, um, in the speaking in evolutionary terms, is highly maladaptive. Why? Because all they need is one dean or one provost who thinks that this enterprise is a waste of time and can start just lopping them off and saving money. All those dead objects occupying the most expensive real estate in the United States. Think about it. In Washington, on the mall. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the center of the university in the center of Berkeley, in the center of uh, Harvard, Cambridge, Massachusetts. All these dead objects occupying the very expensive real estate. You need critical mass, unify. If you have a chance, bring your entomology, your herbarium, your zoology, and your paleontology all together. Gene. Botanical garden, the mystery, botanical garden related, related to a university. We don't have a botanical garden. Uh, we have a herbarium of uh, dried plants, but uh, we don't have a botanical garden. I'm sorry? At Missouri? Missouri. At Missouri. Missouri, is, uh, Missouri has a botanical garden, but Missouri is a standalone museum. It is not associated with the university. Yeah. So, unify, step one. Be unified from the get-go if you can. Unify across approaches, unify across taxa. Ever since it was unified into a biodiversity institution in 1995, we've added more taxa and more approaches. So we added paleobotany in 1995. Uh, it was an opportunity. Tanya yesterday talked about taking advantage of opportunity. We had an opportunity to recruit and attract two of the top paleobotanists in the world, Edie and Tom Taylor, and their incredible Antarctic paleobotany collections. Uh, the best in the world. So suddenly we went from zero paleobotany to the best in the world. And they are integrated into the Biodiversity Institute. Then we added in 1996 invertebrate zoology. It was an opportunity. We got a huge grant from the National Science Foundation and uh, we integrated invertebrate zoology, specifically the study of marine uh, sea anemones and, and um, similar solenerates. In 2005, we added parasitology. That was a calculated move on my part. When you have a chance to reallocate, we had an, a professor leave who was a theoretical ecologist and was in the Biodiversity Institute. He, he was really a fish out of water, to mix a metaphor. Uh, uh, and when he left, it opened up a position for us. 
And we decided we would hire the best, the best person out there who turned out to be a parasitologist. We went from zero to I was national stature in parasitology. And again, uh, parasitology is one of the more neglected aspects of biodiversity. It's the internal biodiversity of organisms. And this individual happens to study the, uh, the um, tapeworms of sharks and rays uh, around the world. Terrific scientist. And finally, in 2005, archaeology, which had been separate because of the politics of the university, they didn't know what to do with archaeology, they gifted it to us. This is an unfunded, gifted mandate. And, <laughs> and we took it. It was unfunded, but we got, whoops, let me go back, sorry. Where am I here? It was unfunded. Guess what? After money, space, space is more important than money at a university. You can always find money. You can't always create space. You gotta be God to create space. But you can, you can be a counterfeiter and make money. We got the building. And that was important. So we took archaeology and said, thank you, we'll take the building. Because then we can use other parts of the building for other things. Finally, we added a, uh, a section in 1998, shortly after I became director of biodiversity informatics research. And as Town said uh, uh, yesterday, uh, when I interviewed as director, I said, if you hire me as director, we're going to bring biodiversity informatics here because that is the future. That is the way to turn what we have been uh, doing for 200 years from description into prediction. A little side story. When I did that, there was a terrific amount of resistance. Terrific amount of resistance. And I'm going to talk about why afterwards. It's not, it, this was, what, 10, 15 years ago. In 15 years, the world of informatics has really evolved, and museums have really evolved in their outlook. But back then, they were still in the Stone Age. They were thinking back in the Pleistocene. What? Informatics? We don't need to do all that. It's a waste of money, and there's lots of reasons not to do it. There's still some who think that way. So how did we accomplish this spread of informatics in the Biodiversity Institute? I used uh, the, the, model, the epidemiological model of a good virus. If you have a lot of resistance in your institution, invest in the person or people who are on board, who have the vision and who can produce the results. So we invested in Professor Peterson and his students and the colleagues he brought on board. And that virus spread. All he did was have to do a few studies that showed, wow, wow, look what we can do with all these centuries of data. We can make predictions about the spread of diseases. And the university caught on, they said wow. NSF said wow, and he and his students started getting grants. And then the other curator said, I want in on this action. I want to get on this bandwagon. And that's what happened. So now the Biodiversity Institute is one of the world's leaders in biodiversity informatics. But better, that's, it's not about us. It's about the fact that other people copied our model. And now we have biodiversity institutes and informatics institutes all over the world. And that's terrific. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. Okay, so here's an org chart where we have a whole bunch. We have botany and entomology, mammalogy, archaeology, ornithology, blah, blah, blah. Biodiversity informatics research, which is completely funded by research grants. We have a public museum and we have a paleontological institute as well. Our mission is teaching, as in every academic institution, teaching, research, and service.
What are some of the challenges we have having made this terrific union? Well, here's the original museum of the four. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. There's the fourth one. These are on main campus. These are on west campus, about separated by about a mile and a half and no, and no transportation system, no, no real good bus system and so forth. Then we added paleobotany, parasitology, and invertebrates in this building, and archaeology in that building. So we are geographically separated. That's a terrible, terrible problem. I said you had to unify conceptually across taxa and across biodiversity research approaches. Step two, here calls it, or it's actually step one as well, is unify across geography. If at all possible, be geographically unified. Because then the people can all be together. The collections don't have to be together. But the people, the researchers and the students, they have to be together to exchange and in this cauldron of ideas and intellectual interchange. Unify the people and activities in one place. Design deliberate spaces for interaction. If you're building a building from scratch, if you're renovating a building for informatics or for biodiversity, Make sure you talk to the architects about creating spaces where people have to collide into each other and talk. Not where they might go, but where they have to go. So for example, some of our uh, units had individual laboratories for preparation of specimens, dry labs, wet labs, and so forth. They were terrible, they were awful. So, the obvious deal was, we'll build you a common lab that's much better and more modern if you agree to collaborate in a common lab. And they did, and that's what, we, that's what we have. So all we have in the Biodiversity Institute now are common laboratories. Common wet lab, common dry lab, common storage of tissues in a cryogenic facility common DNA labs, and so on and so on. A common GIS lab, um, where students from no matter what taxa they're studying, no matter what their approach is in evolutionary biology, they're all in common spaces. And does that lead to increased collaboration? I'm sorry? Does it lead to increased collaboration? Yes. Um, I think it's led to a terrific interchange, say, people working on fish and working on plants or working on birds and working on herbs uh, are seeing how the others are solving these problems. Or if somebody in birds is doing uh, ecological modeling of a certain area, say, in, in, in the Philippines to see the kind of historical biogeography, then they may want to know well, did the same apply to insects? Did the same apply to mammals? And can we learn from that? So yes. Shared labs and facilities. You can't have intellectual unity without geographic unity. It's also a lot easier to administer. You have a lot fewer personnel problems and a lot fewer of the notions of us versus them. Here is the average age of all of our faculty curators and researchers as of 2010. This changed a little bit. Um, there's probably more on the younger and, and less on the older, but I think the principle here is make sure you have a good balance of uh, 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 junior, middle level, and senior people again for this wonderful mixture of uh, synthesis, new ideas, uh, and different approaches. What do we do? What do we do at the Biodiversity Institute? Well, we start with what 
when and where. These are our, we're a bio collections institution, 10 million specimens. What are they, when were they collected, when did they live there, and where did they live? So this is observations and, and documentation through the collections. And the specimen and data acquisition is done according to a body of theory. It's driven by a scientific hypothesis. We don't just make collections uh, just randomly. They're driven by specific research questions. And those research questions, in turn, are based in a body of evolutionary and biodiversity theory.